Uh, good evening. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, uh, the chairs of this uh, uh, International Allergy Congress, Dr. Ruby Bawankar and Dr. Faris Zaytoun, for their fantastic work. And I always told them that they are a very volcano of energy. At the same time, I would like to thank uh, His Highness Sheikh Hamdan for his precious support and scientific support uh, as well. Encouragement. And it's a distinguished pleasure for me to be here today to share with you some important clinical data on advances in the pathogenesis and treatment of nasal polyposis and chronic rhinitis. Now, if I ask you how many of you treated or are treating patients with uh, nasal polyposis or chronic rhinitis and mucitis, show me your hands. I know that all of you, you, you are treating patients like that. So that's a very common and very uh, interesting uh, uh, topic. <coughs> My presentation will be uh, divided uh, in two parts. First, I will be uh, presenting nasal polyposis by reviewing the origin of nasal polyps and the severity of the disease. Uh, I will be touching base on the role of atopy in nasal polyposis, the histopathology and the remodeling of nasal polyposis, the role of eosinophils, T cells, GATA3, FOXP3, and the T regulatory cells. Uh, the important uh, uh, involvement of intercellular signaling pathway involving TGF beta ligand uh, as an anti proliferative cell factor. We'll be also talking about the role of uh, Staphylococcus aureus in nasal polyposis uh, acting as a super antigen, as an allergen, and also the beneficial effect of nasal topical antimicrobial agents such as mupirocin in the nose in a form of a nasal spray, genesis of nasal polyposis, and finally treatment of nasal polyposis. Which brings me to the second part of my presentation, the chronic rhinosinusitis. We'll be touching based on the anatomy and pathophysiology. Uh, the sinus mucosa remodeling appears to be very interesting. The role of uh, allergic rhinitis in uh, repeated sinusitis. Again, uh, the importance of Staphylococcus aureus enterotoxin playing a role of a super antigen and an allergen as well. The potential beneficial effect of nasal topical antimicrobial agent pyrocin in these patients and the potential problems that we all see in our practice, patients uh, having, we, we have to deal with uh, uh, situations such as biofilms, allergic fungal sinusitis, and MRSA, treatment of chronic rhinosinusitis sinusitis at the end. So as you may know that nasal polyposis consists in an edematous uh, opiacent masses in the nasal and paranasal cavities, originating from the lining of the uh, sinuses and collapsing in the nose associated often with allergic fungal sinusitis, cystic fibrosis, short shaft syndrome, and Cartagena syndrome. Looking at the flexible fiber optic, we notice uh, the nasal polyp in the middle layers in here, and on the bottom part of the slide, we see a CT scan of a patient with nasal polyposis, early stage and late stage nasal polyposis, complete opacification of the maxillary, and the etmoidal, etmoidal that the sinus is showing here. Notice that this opacity is homogeneous because I will show you later on, in allergic fungal sinusitis, the homogeneity is heterogeneous, so we have some differences. If you put a scope in the nose of this patient, we will see massive nasal polyposis. The role of atopy in nasal polyposis has been extremely con controversial. I reviewed more than 400 papers and I was unable to really conclude. And some papers suggest that patients that uh, are non-allergic have a higher tendency to develop nasal polyposis. However, this could be a wrong conclusion. Why? Because we can have a false negative allergy skin testing, a false negative in vitro IgE, while we are producing nasal topical IgE uh, in the nose. And that's why I put these uh, uh, arrows in here for you to remember that you can have nasal uh, production of IgE uh, with a negative allergy skin testing and in vitro IgE testing. Of course, more studies should be done in that regard. So the histopathology and remodeling in nasal polyps, uh, as you will know, we do have uh, epithelial dam damage, thickening of the basal membrane, significant uh, edema and fibrosis. We do have also the uh, EG2 plus cells, these are the activated eosinophils in nasal polyposis, versus we have lymphocytes and neutrophils in patients with cystic fibrosis and uh, the uh, ciliary dyskinesia. Plasma cells and macrophages also are a part of the polyp. This is a photonic microscopy of a nasal polyp. As you will notice, we do have infiltration of eosinophils in the subepithelial area, and we have formation of pseudocysts 
uh, pseudocyst results from what? Results from an increased production of albumin that causes this uh, structure of the pseudocyst. In nasal polypose, we have an increase in the GMCSF, we have an increase in interleukin 3, 5, interferon gamma, proliferation of eosinophils. We do have also an increase in IL-5 receptor uh, expression. Uh, furthermore, we have an increase in GATA3. What's GATA3? It's a transcription factor for the DH2 lymphocytes, resulting in the DH2 uh, cytokine increase. And we have a reduction in FOXP3. What's a FOXP3? You know it. It's a transcription factor for the synthesis of the T-Rex, T regulatory cells. These are decreased, resulting in a reduction of TGF beta and increase in IL-5 production. So what we have, we have an increase in IL-5 production, increase in receptor expression of IL-5, boosting the H1 effect, resulting in uh, tissue eosinophilia. This is a very important slide that involves the intercellular signaling and pathway involved in the TGF beta ligand. I'm going to make it simple of interest of time. Normally, TGF beta plays a very important role in apoptosis. What's apoptosis? You know it. It's the death of the cells. In laser polyposis, it has been shown that we have a decrease in TGF beta, therefore we have a decrease in apoptosis, uh, resulting in the formation of a mass in nasal poly. So this is one avenue that one should look at it very closely. What about Staphylococcus aureus? Does it play a role? The answer is yes. Why? Because it produced this uh, Staphylococcus aureus enterotoxin, shown in, uh, in a larger manner. This is a, a microscopy of the molecular structure of the uh, anterotoxin you show in here. There have been 19 of them that have been already isolated. 19 anterotoxin coming from Staphylococcus aureus and play a very important uh, role. Why? They play a role of a superantigen. What's a superantigen? A superantigen binds, as you see it in here, to a T cell receptor and the MHC class 2 molecules, stimulating the T cells, increasing release of cytokines and chemokines, causing major inflammation in the milieu uh, in these patients. So one can say that Staphylococcus aureus enterotoxin is a disease modifier, if you wish. We do have increase of uh, IL-5, aerotoxin, leukotrienes, ECP, IgE, anti-Staphylococcus aureus. We do have also nasal colonization of Staph aureus in 88% of patients with nasal polyposis that we cannot ignore. And Staphylococcus enterotoxin will act as a super antigen, activating the T cells, the B cells, the eosinophils, causing increased release of cytokines, the TH2 pathway, and also it inhibits the T regulatory cells, um, and we do have production of multi-clonal uh, IgE antibodies. So in essence, we do have this uh, super antigen that can occur in a genetically predisposed patient. This will activate the plasma cells and uh, T cells, increasing production of IgE anti-staphylococcus aureus antitoxin, uh, cytokines, I5, and eosinophils. We do have also increased production of albumin that forms the pseudocyst that we see. Macrophages and fibroblasts are also extremely important in these polyps. This is an extremely important slide uh, that shows you the possible genesis of laser polyposis with some important players, the T-Rex and the TGF beta uh, involved in apoptosis. So T-Rex produces TGF beta, TGF beta induces uh, apoptosis and also acts as an anti-proliferative cell factor. So these two events in here are extremely important for the possible formation of the nasal polyp and also inhibits IL-5 production as well. In contrast, in patients with nasal polyposis, we have a reduction in FOXP3, production of uh, superantigens activating the T cells and the B cells. These will activate a variety of cells, as you see in here, very quickly resulting in major edema, uh, delaying apoptosis when the delayed death of a cell, the cell will survive. Plus, we have proliferation of cells as the TGF beta decrease. This results in the formation of nasal polyposis. The clinical uh, Third, for you, it's very important to treat our allochronic patient, to treat our chronic rhinosinusitis patient in order to avoid chronic insult uh, to the nasal mucosa. Which brings us to the treatment of nasal polyposis. First, nasal topical corticosteroids, uh, and this was mentioned earlier, uh, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Ruby Bawankar and other speakers, uh, very effective long term. Systemic corticosteroids, of course, for short term, are effective. Leukotriene blockers, studies show that they are used only as an adjuvant treatment, believe me. Antibiotics uh, could be effective even if only colonization. Remember, we have to get rid of this 
Staphylococcus aureus with the antitoxin problem. Macrolides, again, Dr. Bawankar uh, mentioned this this morning as an antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory type of medication, decreasing I8 and I6, and also it improves the uh, ciliary activity. Uh, doxycycline, some studies show that uh, they are useful in nasal polyposis. And finally, the use of the mupirocin nasal spray, back to back nasal spray, not the ointment and not the cream, but the nasal spray, that I will discuss this study that we conducted a while ago with my colleagues uh, at the next uh, portion of my presentation. And finally, of course, for reconstructive cases, uh, uh, function, functional endoscopic sinus surgery in these patients are not improving. Which brings us to the second part of my presentation, dealing with uh, rhinosinusitis. Initially, I think we have to talk about acute rhinosinusitis. In 100% of cases, we do have viral infection caused in exactly the same shape where it's a viral or a bacterial uh, sinusitis as well. Then the chronic sinusitis, which consists uh, the symptoms uh, last more than 12 weeks with persistent uh, changes on the CT scan, typical CT scan. We see uh, mucosal thickening of the bacterial sinuses, uh, and also some osteomatal uh, complex blockage as well. This is a beautiful slide that I like because it has wonderful colors, and it shows you the normal cycle and the impaired nasal cycle in rhinosinusitis. On the left side of the slide, one can see these green arrows that illustrate the ciliary apparatus uh, clearing the mucus to the osteometal complex. You have to remember that the osteometal complex is not an opening, but it's a tortuous canal allowing clearage of the mucus. On the right side of the slide, one can see what happens during what? A viral infection or a allergic reaction, where we have number one, increase of mucus secretion, number two, decrease in ciliary activity due to ciliary dyskinesia, and number three, blockage of the osteomyotic complex, resulting in a mucostasis that could lead to a replication of microorganisms. Uh, sinus mucosal remodeling is shown in here, where we have a basal membrane thickening. We do have also goblet cell hyperplasia, subepithelial edema, mononuclear cells, and eosinophils are also present there. What about the role of, um, of the uh, allergic rhinitis, the role of atopy in uh, patients with recurrent uh, paranasal sinusitis? This is a study that we conducted, and we showed that patients that were suffering from recurrent uh, sinusitis, when we treated them in the lining allergies, if they were atopic, there was a, about 68% reduction in the exacerbation of the rhinosinusitis. Keep it in mind, if your patient is atopic, you have to treat in the lining allergy to improve uh, uh, sinus ventilation. What about Staphylococcus aureus? Of course, it plays an important role, and this is a very hot topic. Why? Because it produces the anterotoxin. This anterotoxin will act as an allergy, <coughs> see the IgE, causing a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, you know. So right now the patient is no longer allergic to the trees or the grasses, but it's allergic to this anterotoxin that's causing this uh, type of, uh, of uh, allergic reaction. And number two, it acts as a super antigen that uh, stimulates the T cells, increase production of cytokines and chemokines, causing major inflammation in the milieu.